Good morning, Tyus Bauman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Also, good morning, and thank you for having me. Yeah, it'll be exciting to dive into this interesting research that you do. And the first question that I always ask everybody on the show is, what is the problem in our industry and movement? We've got all these sustainability managers, people who work in environmental NGOs, impact startups at the EPA, and they usually know very little, if anything, about environmental psychology. Like, what's the problem with our whole movement when we and not implementing or knowing about this this interesting field? I'm not sure whether there is a problem. I think where my research mostly focuses on is people, their motivations behind pro-environmental actions. And I think if you want to talk about a problem or something that might be going on, which which need to be corrected or might need to be corrected or might need, might need to be changed, I think one big thing is how we think about each other and how motivated each of us is to engage in pro-environmental actions. And often it seems in, in public discourse, but also how things are discussed within politics, within organizations, as if many people are completely not motivated to do so, are relatively egoistic, prefer all things that benefit themselves over things like doing things for the environment. And actually what a lot of my research, but also other research shows is that people tend to care about these kind of topics quite a lot also prioritize them over other topics. So there there seems to be a motivation. I think the big thing we need to do is to make sure that people also act on this motivation. So people seem to be motivated to act or seem to be motivated and seem to be interested in topics related to the environment, protecting nature, et cetera, are worried often about climate change. So there are big polls in the last years which show that majorities of the population really care about these topics. It, of course, varies a little bit between countries. I think you're, you're from Australia, right? So it might be slightly different there than it is in the Netherlands. But often you hear a lot of stories about big opposition, people being unmotivated, unwilling to do so. Whereas the data actually often shows the opposite, that quite a lot of people are quite motivated, are interested in these kind of things. However, there are, of course, many barriers for them to act on these, what we call values or motives. And I think that's the important thing we should target in in many of the things we do. Right, right. So what you're saying is that we can tend to think that you've got people saying the world is a terrible place because people are just greedy and they're selfish and they don't care. And this is often a bit of a trope that gets to the people talk about who really seem to to care about the environment a lot. But what you're saying is that people really do care, but what we have is almost behavioral and social barriers. Some of these barriers are really physical things, like you may not actually be able to buy food without Mm -hmm. plastic around it, or maybe if your kids at school, like the catering is got meat in it and you really have no no choice over that but some of these barriers are also almost social and psychological that it might be uncomfortable to be doing something different yeah true and it's quite a different lens to see things through that it's not just some kind of like human moral failing it's really more like in the value system but also in the actual like structural behaviors that we need to break down for people and that people will will do the right thing if we give them an easier path to do that yes indeed yeah i think it's indeed it's not necessarily Of course, part of it is also an demotivation, and you could, of course, boost these kind of things. But I think many people are already motivated. Indeed, you should enable people, help people to act on these values and act consistently on these kind of values, which support pro-environmental actions. And indeed, many of the things you just mentioned, like people may be obstructed in doing so. It may be impossible for them because they, they can pay it, don't have enough money to perform the behaviors or something else. It might be contextual factors, social factors, but also many psychological factors. Some behaviors are habits, routines, and those are relatively difficult to change. And it doesn't mean that if people do not act consistently in an environmental way that they don't care about the topic, it often means that they have issues realizing these kind of values. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, because one thing that's happened through my whole career, like I've been doing environmental work now for 20 years, been an enthusiast of it ever since I was maybe eight or 10 years old. That's like 30 years now. And the one thing that people say, well, people that are not really environmental, more like normal people would say is that they're like, Katie, nobody cares. You've got to make it about money. You've got to make it or make it like really sexy and appealing or people are just really like selfish. Like they will always reduce it down to reminding me like nobody's going to be interested in the stuff you do. Like, and I just, I just don't buy it, partly because I'm in a community of people that really mm-hmm. do care, 
but I think it's really, it's just interesting for your research to really unveil that. But I think that objection is just, it's wrong. And I've never really bought, bought that objection when people, people bring it up, that, that people just fundamentally don't, don't care. No, no, indeed, it seems like many people do fundamentally care about these kind of, to of topics, of course, to different extents, but you see in many questionnaires. So for instance, in, in Europe, you have a big questionnaire, they send out, I think, every two, three years to many different people in different countries within Europe, in which they also ask about what we call values. And there you see that what we call biospheric values, which is about caring about the environment, caring about nature, feeling a certain connection with nature that people endorse or indicate, or at least that may be an important note to make how people self-report about these things, what they say they find important. So it can be biased, of course, but that many people tend to indicate to really strongly care about these kind of things, as well as more pro-social topics, and much more about these topics than, for instance, what we call egoistic values, which is more about gaining possession, status, power over others, etc., which typically obstruct pro environmental behavior. So there seems to be, or at least many people seem to indicate themselves that these topics are relatively important to themselves. Right. And what was the one big lesson that you got out of your research or the research paper we're going in today about group biospheric values? Yeah, I think there the big lesson is that it seems like many people have misperceptions, basically what you just said, that many people think that, well, maybe they themselves care about this topic, but others don't or care less about this topic or less than they themselves do. And I think the second big lesson, and that's where this paper specifically focuses on, is that how you think about others and how much they care about these kind of topics or so environmental topics, by shirt values, et cetera, that that also influences whether you engage in these kind of actions. So even if you care about it yourself, if you think that others don't care about it, this can demotivate you to engage in these kind of actions because your social environment seems unsupportive for these kind of things or other reasons. But if you think, the less you think others care about this topic, the less you are likely to engage in these kind of behaviors. And I think that's an, well, I think that's the main message that comes out of this, this paper. And I think it's also, well, what, what I found interesting when, when looking at the data that we observed that in general, people tend to think that others care less about the topic than they themselves do. So are seem to be relatively pessimistic about others or optimistic about themselves with regard to this topic. I mean, it's so, so basically we have this bias of thinking that when we look at, say, a freeway, so I live in the Bay Area and there's this huge freeway called the 101. I think it's got like five or six lanes on either side, full of traffic. You look at all those cars and you just think, nobody cares. Nobody cares about, look at all these people in these cars. And so then when we have this bias, we just assume that society as a whole or various different groups that are different to us don't care, then it gives us a demotivating effect. And we're not even really getting to the causal mechanism of, of what's going on. So if we just check our own bias, this bias that we are assuming that the group does not care as much as they actually do and we shift our our bias or what it would be if we were accurate realizing that people actually do care they're just kind of like trapped in these systemic problems and the way it's designed and then we can be more motivated so it's actually a far better headspace a far better worldview and more accurate worldview to take on to, to just not let those thoughts come in, not let those kind of really pessimistic thoughts come in about, about people and the world and their apparent selfishness, because they're not helpful. They're going to demotivate you. And if you actually see that people are good, then you'll yourself be more motivated. And you'll also be imitating these perceived value systems as well, because humans copy each other. So if you think that the group is really into green stuff, then you'll be more into it. So it's just, so we kind of need to check our own bias, I think, in the way that we're, we're perceiving the group around us. Agree. Yeah, I think that's also where some of our research is now also focusing on, on how can you, well, correct. I find it a bit difficult to talk about bias because, of course, a large part of it is based on what people themselves say is important to themselves. And you have things like social desirability. People want to present themselves in certain ways. So we still need to focus or research better how accurate all these reports are. But it seems indeed well, the consistent finding seems to be that people think that they care more about this topic than others. And they think that they indicate that this is an important topic already means that it's something at least they think is worth caring about and is important to say that you care about, which I think is also quite a positive message. And I think indeed, 
it is really important to make people aware about that others care about this topic and maybe sometimes also that people themselves care about these topics as well because i think for many people there's also for instance research on what we call an environmental self-identity that's how environmental people perceive themselves and also by reminding people about past actions they perform pro environmental actions they performed you can boost this identity with then which then in turn can also motivate these kind of behaviors so i think it's also that you make people aware about other there environmental actions your own environmental actions and this might indeed create some kind of atmosphere or whatever that may stimulate people to engage in more pro-environmental actions and i think it relates a lot to what you just said about the traffic for instance many people focus on the things that are going wrong and sometimes it might also be good to focus on the things that are going in a good way or the polls that indicate that many people care about a certain topic also to motivate yourself motivate others to take these kind of actions and yeah, and so by, I think it's interesting what you what you mentioned before, it's come up sometimes with, with other guests that reminding people of other environmental things that they've done in the past actually helps strengthen that environmental identity and helps encourage more pro-environmental behaviours. And it's also part of a social norms thing. I mean, if someone says that like 32% of people believe that we should eat less meat or we should bring in carbon better carbon policies, and you read that, you're like, oh, yeah, the group does. It's like a standard kind of social norms message, but it's also kind of reflecting that the group does have this value and everybody's not just selfish and and evil. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about an objection that I keep getting. It comes up almost every day or every time I do a guest lecture now, which is people say, why do, we, why do you focus, what do you care about individual behavior or individual action when individual action doesn't matter and we need, what we need is government and systems level change? So isn't it just kind of irrelevant to consider this stuff? I think many of, well, basically, so even with governmental change, you aim to also change behaviors of people. So basically we collectively do things together which have an impact on the environment. And by targeting individuals, so the, the behaviors of each individual contribute to this problem. So you also should target them or think about these kind of things but when you want to mitigate or, or, or change the current situation. And I fully agree that focusing on policy, more structural changes, et cetera, that, that it's super relevant and important too. And I think in fact, for this, it's also in order to make that happen, they should also believe that these things are important to the people because politicians will only take the actions that they think are supported by their voters because otherwise well no politician is willing to take a certain action if they think that afterwards nobody will vote for them again so i think creating this message and also showing that you care about these things also gives a message to those people so that the people who make the decisions to take these actions to for instance support you and enable you to act on your values your pro-environmental values and i think yeah it, it's of course a difficult problem because it's such a huge problem but if nobody acts nothing will happen so you need the actions of all the individuals in order to achieve something and to change something and that also includes well just individual citizens yeah, I mean, it's a big, many. complex topic, and I've been writing down notes from multiple sources. I, I think I'm going to put together, like, a huge essay of, like, all of the different, carving up these different relationships between individual and collective action and, and government action. But one thing I see happening in that, in how to answer that question is that, <clears throat> well, for a start, that the government can't do everything for us. There are a lot of things like, say, like eating less meat, like the government's not going to suddenly make all meat all over the world in every country illegal. That's something that we really only can probably mostly have in our own in our own power. And there are many, many examples like that. But when we're talking about individual behaviors so they're like the little behaviors like eat less meat the switch over to an electric vehicle you buy less stuff there are these kind of individual behaviors but then there is which those kind of things have like a net environmental footprint effect but then you've also got the environmental attitude and those things are highly related if you have a high environmental attitude you will be more likely to do environmental behaviors and this is where it intersects with government policy if the government's trying to get quite a strong policy through like say in 10 years making sure that you can only buy electric cars so it'll just be completely illegal to buy regular gasoline cars you just won't be able to buy them anymore that's a really strong and bold policy an aggressive carbon tax is a very strong and bold policy peak pricing of electricity so we're really paying for the carbon in the peak times bold really difficult policy to get through 
unless you've got a population of people that have a high environmental attitude, which is very related to these small individual actions that people are doing in their behavior, but also their mind space, people are going to fight the policy. They're not going to let it through. So in that way, all these little tiny actions, like just that you recycle your headspace, your, which is connected to your political outlook, like you're not going to have the government changes unless you've got people ideologically primed. And you're not going to have people totally ideologically primed and then be like, yeah, I'm really into government policy, but I'm going to like use as much electricity as possible. I'm just going to like eat loads of beef. I'm going to like litter everywhere I go. Like these two things come together in the one personality. You can't, you can't separate them. So that's what I kind of like understood from your answer and just another dimension of this, this complex issue. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I think, yeah, you need, you, so in order to get certain policies through, you need the support of the people. And I think also for policymakers to develop certain policy, policies or to support a certain decisions, they also need to have the feeling that people support these kind of things because otherwise they won't propose these things. So in that case, it's also really important that as an individual, you're really clear about your motivations and where you care about. And I think another important thing to note here is that opposition to policies is not necessary. So what you often hear is also that something like carbon tax is then introduced or discussed and that there's a lot of opposition. And that opposition not necessarily means that people are against the environment. I think it's not an important problem, don't want to invest in it. It can also be caused by many different things so that they might not trust the politicians who made the policy or that there are other factors driving their opposition. So I think what often happens here is that this is attributed to a lack of motivation to do something environmental, but often many of the opposition is caused by other factors that they don't want to be someone with strong power that they want to decide on these things themselves. So these kind of motives might also play a role here. So it's not necessarily that they oppose to the environment or think it's not important, but they might oppose to this policy for other reasons as well. And I think that's also important when you think about well, what we just said, so that people might be demotivated by the when they have the idea that others don't care about this topic, it's also very important to be realistic on what might drive this, this, this opposition. Is it really that people don't care about the environment or might it also be other reasons which make them opposed to these kind of policies? Yeah, and that's one thing that this social science does that no other branch of environmental studies does, which is deeply trying to understand the causality of why things are the way they are. All I come from an engineering background. Most people in sustainability are engineers and scientists. And we just see the world in terms of like, just like the data and the numbers. And if people aren't doing the right thing, it's like, oh, well, it's obviously because of some big corporation or because people don't care. Like, I think we're really bad at understanding the causality of why things are the way they are and really trying to get to the heart of the nuance of why things why things get the way they are that they could yeah it's not just that people like hate climate change or they don't care it could be something else it could be something kind of unconscious or some kind of like social bias or some group thing that's going on but my, my other kind of objection that 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 comes up that I wanted to ask you about was the value action gap. So your, this research paper really relies on this concept that having high biospheric values, which you mentioned are earth values, we care about the planet, predicts environmental behavior. But then there's this thing called the value action gap that says if we really educate people about sustainability and we really get them to care, that doesn't always lead to to, to action because it's kind of not designed for action. It's designed for education and concern. So people watch all these documentaries about climate change and then they never ever get around to putting solar on their house. So the way I'm trying to carve up this question is with the value action gap, you've got these things called like education and environmental concern. Are values like something quite different to education and concern or are they all kind of like mixed up in the one thing no, and I, how do we is it really true that biospheric values predicts predicts environmental behavior i think the finding that biospheric values or these values relate or underlie environmental actions that's supported widely by many different studies so many different studies indeed show that the more people care or endorse these biospheric values as well as altruistic values the more likely they are to engage or have an intention to engage in pro environmental behavior and also to engage in pro environmental behavior. So there are many studies focusing on this and this relationship is quite strong. Indeed, there is a gap between the values 
and the actions people take. And I think that relates a lot to what we just discussed. There are many, I think you have values on the one hand, the core motivation, the really the underlying factor that drives many things. So what you find important, what goals you want to achieve. So how we define a value is a desirable goal. So something you want to strive for in your life. And there are many different values and people endorse many different values. And this values or all those values are the, 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 the foundation or the basis of many of people, their actions. And on the other hand, you have, or on the other side of the process, you have the actual actions, but there are many steps in between. So it's not that those values, if you have a certain value that you always will take these actions. Often these actions have consequences for other values you find important as well. So I think what's also the wrong idea is that you have either environmental people or egoistic people. Typically people care about both. So they might care about the environment, but of course, to many people, possessions are also really important. So they also want to have, I don't know, nice products or, or, or whatever. So it's for basically for all those values, it's something many people care about. And the prioritization is different. So you might find some values more important than others. But still, if you have a certain action, which is clearly environmental beneficial, so it would be an action that supports your biospheric values. And it seems like that if you have those strong biospheric values, that you will definitely take that action. If that action is super costly, so for instance, costs a lot of money or super inconvenient, it also opposes to other values you may find important as well. So for instance, these egoistic values or what we call hedonic values, which is more about convenience, pleasure. And in those situations, there's what we call a value conflict. And that might also, if the cost of that behavior are simply perceived as being higher than the benefits it has. So for instance, the cost for egoistic and hedonic values are bigger then environmental benefits or the perceived environmental, environmental benefits of that behavior, then simply people don't engage in these behaviors. And I think another thing is, so this is mostly about, well, this, this basis people have, those core motivation, the foundation for many actions, but values are relatively abstract. So it's our very general goals people have. And in order to translate those to those concrete behaviors, there are many different steps in between. So you need to be aware of certain consequences. So you need to be aware that there is an environmental problem, for instance. If you are aware of that, you need to be aware how to deal with it. So what to do, how to do it, what kind of options are available. You need to feel a certain feeling of responsibility to take those actions. So there are many different steps through which those values relate to those actions. And I think at all of these steps, certain factors may cause people to not act in line with their values because they might not know how to do it or they might not see the problem, a specific problem or something like that. And those are all things you could also address in, for instance, interventions as well as in policies. So enable people. So, so make sure that all those small barriers in those steps are taken away. Yeah, the way I, the way I am see it now is a little bit like like Russian dolls or like more like a fruit with like a, a seed in the middle that the values and the attitude is kind of like the core maybe it's like an avocado with the seed in the middle and that and a lot of people environmental people will just assume that the values and the attitude will do everything for you if you care about nature if you have an environmental pro-environmental attitude, then tink, 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 every single behavior will just like roll out and then it'll all just kind of like happen perfectly. But that's where we do still need to focus on having environmental values and behavior, but you need, it needs to be approached like an action designer. Like are there stuff in the way stopping people? And there are so many different parts of the psychology that get people to actually take action. And so if you were putting like a whole bunch of people like through a an action design process. We want to get people to sign up for getting solar panels, EVs, maybe writing a letter to a politician, turning up to a city council meeting. The people with the high environmental values are going to be much more likely to make it through those steps. The people with the low environmental values aren't going to make it through. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to be behavior designers. We still really need to focus on the action and the behavior. And you've just got like a lot more fuel in the tank to work with, like psychological fuel in the tank to work with somebody who really cares about the environment and someone who doesn't care that much. I mean, when I first started approaching environmental psychology, I kind of thought that, oh, like in caring about the environment just doesn't matter at all. I was like, oh my God, there's all this stuff that says that it doesn't matter at all. Like as long as you just like kind of like compare people and kind of gamify it, you can get people to do anything, which is a kind of a lens that I think is true in a certain capacity, but there is a lot more nuance in it when you bring this through and you actually see the kind of interplay between these, between these two, two things. What I thought was really interesting in your paper also, that's something I have not seen before, which is the distinction between 
values and social norms. And when I was first reading it, I'm just like, aren't you just talking about social norms? Like, and then I read a bit further and it says, this is why values and social norms are so different. And then that opened up this whole, like, just really interesting space of like more like deeply understanding the why. Can you talk about that a bit? Like what's the difference between values and social norms and maybe what social norms are because not everybody knows what they are. And what is this big question of understanding why, the big why behind everything? Yeah, I think so. You're mostly talking, I think, about descriptive norms. So what you think other people's, what kind of actions they do, or maybe what, what kind of actions other people, so that are, those are descriptive norms. You also have injunctive norms, which are about what you think people approve or, or these kind of things. And I think the big difference between these kind of norms and values is values is really the core motivation behind them. Whereas the norms are more focusing on the actions. So the norms are more focusing on this is what you should do. This is what other people do. And that are maybe very specific actions may also be general actions. And the values are actually the reasons why people either do it or think these things should be done. It, it, it's the underlying goal behind the norms. And typically those values are much more abstract, much more general. And I think an advantage of that is that it may influence many different behaviors because it's a very general motive that, that relates to many different things. So if those values are strong, people are motivated to engage in many different behaviors which are in line with those values. Whereas a norm is often much more specific. So also relatively strongly predicts a certain behavior, specific behavior, but only that behavior unless that underlying goal is there, this value, and then it might also relate to other behaviors. So I think how you could distinguish between them is the values are very abstract, relate to many different things. There's underlying goal or purpose where people do things for, and norms are some slightly more concrete translation of those values to specific actions. Well, how would you describe it, say, for something like plastic in the ocean? What would be a norm versus a value? I think, so the value is simply that you care about the environment, nature, environment. So that could be a value. So by short value, simply caring about nature, the environment, feeling connected with nature, these kind of things. The norm in this case would be, you should not throw your trash on the ground or plastic trash, or you should not take a plastic bag when shopping uh, or seeing others not doing these kind of things. So there it's much more concrete than this much more abstract underlying goal, why you should not take a plastic bag or accept a plastic bag in a shop or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was super interesting because I was just thinking a, a lot about environment, this concept of environmental leadership recently. And I'd never thought about leadership before. I kind of thought that was like something that you would do if you were like a politician or like a sports, like you manage a sports team. And I never I identified with it. And then I realized that this power of the group, the group is so powerful and that we all kind of need to see ourselves as like leaders of groups, even if it's just five people, like we're trying to influence, like if we've got a little like club in a big corporation, you get these little like in-group clubs and corporations who will like get together as little climate activist group not not their bosses telling them to do it they'll just naturally emerge and so we're all kind of doing environmental leadership in in this way and i was thinking about all the things you needed to do in terms of a to help lead a group and i just wrote down the idea of defining the group's values which is something that i borrowed from dating like one thing that when you're looking for a partner or dating they say don't go for like maybe the egoistic values of someone connect on values. And I was like, it really struck me. I thought we really do deeply connect on shared values. It's how we create friendships. It's how we create really good romantic relationships, how we choose companies that we want to work with. It's really, really important. And so I thought in terms of if people like have a group, but doing a kind of like a, so I, this phrase values design, like, do we need to have, should we be having like values design workshops or really explicitly talking about this, getting a little bit more out there in terms of and getting a bit more nuanced about not just an earth biospheric values but a bit more specific like dolphins ocean marine mammals like we really these species particularly matter or have something to do with more with trees or more with children like we really have a value that children have a, a right and a necessity to green space and gardening activities for their mental health really getting nuanced with what the environmental value is so anyway Long, long question, long way of describing the question. The question I'm trying to say, why do groups matter so much for us to see the lens, to see environmental change through the lens of a group? And if you have a group, like what would your advice be to them about this idea of like designing and actively really working on 
certainly communicating your values in, in that group. Yeah, it's, so why groups matter? So there's a lot of, of research focusing on groups and the importance of group. I think in this case, groups matter on many different for many different reasons. I think one core reason is that groups are, of course, important to us. So we, we function in society. We are part of many different groups. Can be colleagues, can be sport clubs, can be friends, can be family, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those people are important to you, also to how you see yourself and also the things you find important. So therefore, also many of the things they or what you think they care about have an influence on what you will do because those people are simply important to you. And there's also research showing that actually the groups you belong to is part of, well, really part of how you see yourself. So you have a social identity and part of, well, how you see yourself, your identity is also based on the groups you, you, you are part of. So when you have certain ideas about groups, you're really likely to to act in line with these ideas or with what you think is important within that group. So that, that has some important reasons. Of course, evolutionary, there's also many reasons why groups are important to us. It's quite difficult to survive on your own. So you're basically in your life dependent on many different people. And also within this specific problem, I think it's also quite important to stress that you need the actions of many different people. So it might also be either motivation or demotivation if you think either good or bad about how environmental other people are because maybe also what you, you you discussed earlier so how much do individual actions matter if you as an individual have the feeling nobody else takes action then you might might think well my, my actions quite, are quite useless nobody else is doing why should I sacrifice things me alone when nobody else is doing something so I think in that sense it's also how how impactful do certain behaviors are I think it's also really important dependent on how your perceptions of others and your perceptions of groups. So yeah, you, you, you need to feel supported, supported by people you care about. And I think also to have some kind of feeling of efficacy, you also have, it's important to have the idea that you're not on your own, that many other people are also taking these kind of actions. Yeah. And do you think that really getting clear on the values of a, of a group. And I know your study looked at very, very large groups, which was people's political identity, but I'm thinking like small groups, like the students in a class or employees in an office, or maybe parents at my, my daughter's school or the school teachers, a group, like, like a much more intimate type of, type of group like that. Do you think if rather than just assuming, oh, we're all here because climate change matters, like very, very broad level value, but in really taking some time to consider the values and to really use that as the emotional bond that we could create much greater group cohesion. Like, do you think mm -hmm. focusing on values more rather than just taking some time to really focus and flesh out values could create a more cohesive, emotionally cohesive group than if we were just like, it's just kilowatts and carbon, just looking at the numbers. Yeah, no, definitely. I think these underlying reasons are really important also to bond with people. So we also are working on different of these kind of interventions, also how to make people discuss environmental problems or certain interventions within or, or technological solutions, for instance, within neighborhoods or different parties involved in that and how to make sure that you are aware of each other's values, how those relate to those different actions or how people perceive those values to relate to different actions because there are also individual differences in that. So might be, so for instance, for a wind park, some people might support it because of environmental values because it's a more sustainable way of producing energy, but others with very strong environmental values or biospheric values might oppose to it because it might, for instance, kill birds. So then basically the same value might underlie two different responses to the same action. And I think talking about these kind of things, understanding each other might also make people better cooperate on these kind of things. So learn from each other how they think about it. And it's not necessarily a value problem so that you're fundamentally caring about different things, but it's more how you translate these kind of things to action and also make more realistic decisions on these, these, these topics. Right. That's a really interesting lens in which to view it because environmental issues can be very, very polarizing. Like I was recently chatting to a, a group that's trying to get a bill through for green roofs. I think they're trying to get $500 million through for the federal government to fund green roofs on schools. And I asked them, I said, what would be, you think green roofs on schools, everyone would like, like who wouldn't want a green roof on a school? Super friendly, non-controversial. And I said, what's the biggest risk of this bill not getting through? like what would make it fail and she said the biggest risk is that it gets politically polarized as a climate change bill 
we are going completely on jobs and children's health. And we are staying completely away from climate change, even though the green roofs really help with the energy, like it's totally supportive of climate change. But if they run the risk of polarizing it, then all the people in who approve it in Congress will say no to it. So it's all like jobs, 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 kids, kids, kids. But by, I mean, that's like a big federal example, but in terms of smaller examples, we might be trying to get through with our community. If you take a politically polarizing stance on something, like maybe like everybody should give up meat and dairy altogether. For a lot of people, that's quite unfriendly for them. Uh, And then if you were to connect on more of a deeper, like shared value, which is we believe being healthy is important and we don't want to, we want to decrease animal suffering and nice healthy food matters and healthy children matter that going, identifying that value system, really crystallizing it in a way that we're all going to connect on that could really dissolve those kind of natural barriers that come up. And there are a lot of big barriers that come up with sustainability that people people don't like. A lot of people think things are disgusting as well. Like they think composting toilets are disgusting, reusable packaging, reusable women's menstruation products. They're like, they even some people even think the idea of growing their own food is filthy. Like there are these, these huge barriers that maybe we can come to see the same light on if we get a bit more meta about the value system. That's what I do. I just repeat back to you what you say yes. in my words without asking a question. <laughs> it helps me crystallize well, what you're saying. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, yeah, I think it definitely makes sense indeed to, 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 yeah, to look at it in that way. I never, I never really thought about it like that before. I have this other question of just this, this thing I've been starting to notice in our movement, which is it feels like all the government programs and the big not-for-profit programs tend to see people like their islands. Like I don't get a lot of a sense that whenever people, there are these kind of like messages asking people to act or to do stuff, that we're seeing people as these groups and these interconnected webs of humans, like this kind of capillary system of that I'm really, I'm not, I'm not an island, I'm a network and mm-hmm. we're all networks and this kind of this social network effect. And it completely missing the concept, missing the network effect, missing the whole group dynamic and just being a major organization like the EPA or Greenpeace, or whatever, going straight to you as an individual or a corporation being like this, do this, do this, do this behavior. I mean, do you also see this kind of like failing as seeing everybody as islands and, and not coming at it from a, a social network or a group perspective? Yes and no. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure whether all, but it might also be a difference between how it's approached here and how it's approached there in Australia. But I have the feeling that now there are quite many of these organizations are also focusing on groups. So for instance, when the organizations target, for instance, sport clubs or these kind of things to, to start talking about these topics and really use these kind of identities in order to promote those actions. So also that groups which are relatively close to people if they are supporting some things, it might for those people also be easier to engage in these kind of actions or show that they also care about these kind of topics. And I have the feeling personally that these things are done much more free- frequently and are quite getting quite common now. So yes, I fully agree with what you say. I'm not entirely sure whether many, many companies do that, but it might also be a, a difference between maybe the Netherlands and Australia. And I think there are many differences because also what you just discussed about the topics being very polarized, politicized. I think, for instance, particularly with climate change, that I believe that in Australia is quite a politicized topic. So I think there are some studies on this also from, for instance, Matthew Hornsey is showing that, for instance, US and Australia are quite strong on, on this polarization so that you have really two different political camps, either having one or the other opinion. I think in many other countries, it's not that strong. So the politicization of these kind of topics is much, much less. And indeed, I think it also relates a bit to what you said, is that there the topic might be more about seeing it as an environmental problem and and that caring about the environment might be in different ways, but many of political parties do in some way care about the environment more generally, so at the value level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find in general, in the split between left and right affiliated people, that I'm far less interested than I ever was in trying to 
criticize or box people in between their political affiliation because what I see now and it's partly come from having children because you spend a lot of time at the playground talking to other parents and see the world a bit differently but even if somebody is like really really right wing and really doesn't have those a lot of the value systems I might have from my more left-wing community I still feel like that person as a person probably shares 95 percent the values that we do share like we think that cruelty is bad we believe in having good manners if my child was hurting they would probably they may risk their own life to save my child I think probably someone who was very right wing and maybe even like hunts and kills animals they might do that they probably would and they probably also don't believe in littering like we probably actually even with people that seem very polarized to us on maybe some topics usually like whatever the topics of the day are that's the other 95% of us are still holding the same value systems. And that's really the way I go through the world now. And I don't try to create a wall with people that if they maybe like maybe something like some people are, a lot of people, people are against abortion in America and Christian people are against abortion. Like, obviously I don't hold that value system and none of my friends and peers would, but I would not let that get in the way of the other value systems that I think do matter. And that I wouldn't let it get in the way of, the bond. Whereas I think some people let those things get, get in the way anyway. So I'm kind of rambling, but what I'm just trying to trying to say is that we share so many similar values with people around us, even people that might seem at first very, very different. And we should focus on the stuff that we do agree on in our values rather than the ones that we don't agree on. And maybe we can all get along better if we do that more. Yeah, true. I, I think also, so what we just discussed about that people perceive themselves to be, for instance, caring more about biospheric values than they think others do. I think what's also a general pattern is that differences people perceive between groups are way larger than when you look at the individuals within those groups and, and where they actually care about. So we ask these different, many different value questionnaires to many people from different groups. And then you see at an individual level, so how they score on these values, there are not that big differences between the groups. But if you look at how they think, they themselves, so people from their own group, as well as people from the other groups, what kind of values they endorse, there are huge differences. So people tend to overestimate these differences between the groups quite a lot. And where in fact, indeed, many people within those groups are, are relatively similar to each other. Right. So we're all basically pretty much the same, but we tend to think that the other is like way, way nastier than they, than they really are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say that we are all the same. I think people are quite different from each other, but I think differences mm. within groups are often way larger than between groups. And I think right. many people expect that within a group, it's relatively homogeneous. So everybody's similar to each other and that it's also for a group you're not belonging to. And they are similar to the, to the people within that group and completely different from you. But, but typically there's a lot of variation within those groups and actually those groups don't differ that much from each other. Mm. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. I also noticed in your paper this phrase, the self-transcendence cluster, which I didn't know yes. what it meant, but I thought it sounded really cool because <laughs> I just started doing reading Scott Barry Kaufman's book, Transcendence. And I was like, what? I actually don't even know what the word transcendence means, but it sounds cool. It sounds like something I probably want to do. Like, what is it? What is it? What does it mean? It's just a more general, higher level cluster of values. And so, so basically you have to, well, there are different value theories. One of the, the prominent value theories is the Schwartz value theory, and they or, or, or what, what they do is they define different values, which are universally endorsed. So all the people in the world endorse those values to some extent, but they differ in how strongly they endorse each of these values. And you can cluster those values in different, different groups. And for instance, one of those values, and that, that's the one we have been talking about a lot, is biospheric values. You also have altruistic values, which is more about caring about others, pro-social motives, et cetera, et cetera. And those belong in the self-transcendence cluster. So it's basically caring about things which are outside of yourself. So things that are larger than you as an individual. And on the opposite end, you have, for instance, the egoistic values, the more hedonic values, these kind of things, which is really about things about you as an individual. So gaining possessions, gaining power, you as an individual, being ambitious, uh, need for pleasure, comfort, gratification of your desires. And those are clustered in the larger group of what we call self-enhancement values. So the one that's really focusing on you as an individual and getting as much for you as an individual as possible. The other one is what we call the self-transcendence values. And it's more about, uh, if you care a lot about these things, you care about, you want to invest in something larger than yourself as well. 
Are they all just in two buckets, like either bigger than it's, self or within oneself, or there are there other buckets? There are also other buckets, and it also depends on the level of how how you specify them. Specifically, those two are relevant for pro-environmental behavior. So there's a lot of research focusing on what kind of values are relevant for pro-environmental pro behavior, and specifically the self-transcendence cluster and self-enhancement cluster, and then specific values within those clusters are typically related to environmental actions. So typically, biospheric and altruistic values promote these kind of actions. So people who more strongly endorse these values are more likely to engage in environmental action, whereas people typically, so in, on average, people who more strongly care about those self-enhancement values are typically less likely to engage in these actions. But it's not always the case because some pro-environmental actions might also be beneficial for you as an individual, might, might actually, if you put solar panels on the roof, you might also earn money in the long term. So it might also benefit some of those self-enhancement values. So it's not always like that, but if you look at it at a very general level, the stronger people endorse self-transcendence values, the more likely they are to engage in pro-environmental behaviors, the stronger people endorse self-enhancement values, the less. Right, right. So how do we kind of push everybody to become more of the self-transcendent type? I'm just interesting as you're explaining it, just re realizing how important that is to me in terms of who I get close to in my life. Because if I start seeing signs of people being more self-interested than they are transcendent, interested it's completely repulsive to me as a friend like if like like a guy has like a sports car like a really expensive like like a three hundred thousand dollar relief like it, it disgusts me like i really really don't like it whereas somebody who was of a different type of worldview or personality they would like it but obviously like i like it if somebody's got a tesla which is also kind of an expensive car right but it has a different value system to just something that's just a purely like ego driven car or Someone that spent their whole life just devoted to making money, I find that kind of gross. Slightly yeah, respected. I think there you, you really know, have a like... conflict between two value yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. So indeed, then you value on very fundamental things. And, and that's indeed might explain why you really don't like such a person, because that person has really different values than you have. And, and yeah, that might be difficult in relationships. So, so I think in that sense, I completely understand that if you care a lot about one, you're less, so, so one type of values, and, and relatively little about the other type of values because you can also care about both. So, so it does not necessarily mean that if you care about one, you doesn't, don't care about the other at all. So you can care about both, but typically those with self, strong self-transcendence values are relatively lower on the self-enhancement values. And I think if indeed your self-transcendence values are very strong and your self-enhancement values are very weak or relatively weak, then indeed someone with the exact opposite values might really be unattractive to you. And the same, of course, applies to someone with very strong self-enhancement values. They might also think about people with very strong self-transcendence values, not sure what those people are and be really unattractive to those people. So I think indeed it's our sort of the fundamental principles people have, the things they really care about. And if they are not aligned with each other, you're probably not going to like that person. Yeah, the very like self, the more egoistic people that have invested a lot of time into their own personal success, they probably think we're just like losers, like, oh, like you've got just riding yeah, around on your bicycle, you don't have a fancy car, your clothes aren't expensive, yuck, who wants to be, who be, be like that? But are these, um, I mean, are they kind of, are these values injected into you in, in, in childhood? I was just thinking about the way I was, I had a kind of an unusual upbringing that I was raised between two homes. So my parents got divorced, raised between these two homes that were really as opposite on this thing that we're talking about as, as possible. So my main home with my mother's family was very conscientious of not wasting, like always turn the lights off. We never bought too much. We never, not not for the environment, but just to kind of like a bit of a throwback to like wartime Germany when nobody ever wasted anything. And just very kind of like conscientious of animals and not wanting to squash things and fairly like socialist leaning. And then I would go and stay at my dad's place and he'd married this really flashy American woman who totally opposite value system. And she just bought clothes after clothes. She had a whole room full of clothes and all this makeup and this big diamond ring. And they had expensive cars and holiday houses and an airplane. And it just disgusted me as a child because it was so against my primary value system. They were as opposite as they could be. This woman who just embodied everything that I was raised to think was revolting about, about people. And she wasn't a very nice person even. But it makes me think is like, is the only way to give people this transcendent identity or value system to just 
in childhood? Can you, how do, how do we, how do people get it? Yeah. Where does it come from? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. And there's also quite some debate about it. Uh, I think indeed it's something that develops during childhood. And there there's also quite some literature on that. Whether you can change it later in life, there's a lot of debate about what, what, what are the possibilities there. Also, whether it's ethical to do something like that, because it's also a bit weird to change people, their values. It's also maybe not something you might feel comfortable in doing, imposing your own ideals on someone else. And that's also, I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether you could consider that ethical. That's a debate on its own. But well, there is some research which shows that very big life events, for instance. So when someone mi migrates from one country to another country, that then in that case, values might, for instance, change. Or when something very big happens, like the COVID crisis now, that that could have an effect on people. So really big life events, which really had an impact on people, their lives that that might cause certain shifts in values. But at an individual level, so for an indiv so, so one person throughout their lifetime, I think that the main part is indeed within the child childhood. So when they grow up, adolescence, they learn about what's important, it depends on their social environment, what their parents care about, maybe their peers care about, what's being discussed, et cetera, but also what kind of topics are important at that time. That really, well, it, it, it is quite, detrimental and how or important in how people, uh, what, what, what kind of values they have. And changing them is relatively difficult, but you see changes, I think, over generations that might be changing or uh, changes occurring. Mm. So it, environmental education work in childhood, it sounds like it could be perhaps like more, well, it's probably, I think everybody does think it's a big deal, but trying to impress those value systems on with kids in childhood, it wouldn't make it perhaps an immediate win because the kid still has to grow up but it could be really really powerful i just posted this quote to twitter from an article that i read that said something like 30 percent of kids plan on being vegan now in the uk like they're already self-identifying as vegan and these were young children like eight ten years old like not, not not teenagers yet and i was like wow like be in my generation being vegan or vegetarian was a very like fringe thing and a lot of us have kind of adopted that and we've raised our children now the second generation's coming up and that's a tipping point that's like over 25 percent like it's very likely that that next generation will tip it over and turn eating meat to a very like fringe behavior and if that can be encouraged in the childhood journey it can it can stick for a for a lifetime yeah, indeed. Yeah, and that's also where some of our research is now focusing on is on how do those values develop, for instance, within school classes, within the peer networks, etc. What determines what kind of values they endorse, and also here the group values are of course really important. So how you perceive your peers to endorse certain values might have a very strong influence on what you yourself care about. Right, right. I mean, it's amazing how absorbent children are to these messages i mean i've got a six-year-old you said you've got a six-year-old as well yes <laughs> um, like i teach her about energy vampires it's a really fun thing and we draw little pictures she draws little pictures for me of energy vampires like a like a light with little like bat swings and so i've taught her i'm like we have to switch the light off because it's an energy vampire and it's sucking electricity and it's going to put carbon dioxide out and it's going to hurt the coral it's all about the coral she understands what that is and so she's really good at finding energy vampires. If I forget a light, she's like, mommy, it's an energy vampire. Like you've got to turn it off. Like, <laughs> and I taught her about the differences between the cars, like the electric cars versus the fossil fuel cars. We still have just a regular car, not an EV. So she's like, mommy, when are we going to get an electric car? Like, I really don't want our car. It's like hurting the corals. And I'm like, I know we'll get to it soon, sweetie. We're just going to organize some things. And she picks up litter on the street and she's like, I'm being a good earth doctor. I taught her how to be an earth doctor. And like, it didn't take much. Like she totally has absorbed it. And now she's kind of leading me. Now she's the one, like she gets mad at me if I don't pick up trash like on the ground. She was like, you can't leave it there, mommy. It's going to like go into the ocean and hurt a turtle. Like she's like, mommy, aren't you going to be a good earth doctor today? And I'm like, oh, can you please just like leave? Like I want to get to school. But the kids are like, so it's like, you don't need to put in much effort into that age to get them to be really responsive. Whereas to somebody who's like fully grown, it's like, it's really hard to, to turn them. Anyway, it's fun. It'd be fun to probably just teach children environmental values all day long. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing it personally, but indeed it, it are fun projects to look at these kind of things and also how these things are discussed then. I think it's also a big problem. So I think many children are also interested in these kind of topics, but it's not always being discussed that 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 clear. So so not all programs focus that clearly on these kind of topics. I think indeed in order to make people 
and children appreciate, for instance, the environment. It's also something where you need to be taught about, need to learn about, need to experience, etc. Yeah, and another question that people ask me a lot, and the only answer I have to it is the tipping point. Early innovators into it, and then that leads to more people, and then eventually the majority comes along. And the question is, they're like, yeah, sure, Katie, everybody's into this green stuff and they're people like us. They're people who vote left, we'll put on solar panels, we have like a science degree. What about all the other people? What about the people out in like the Midwest? They vote for Trump, they like are anti-climate change, all they want to do is watch TV and drink. I don't even know if these people are like, they're like imaginary people or whether they're actually a person that we've met. Because I think sometimes people imagine these kind of like huge imaginary chunks of humans that aren't real people they've met but they were like well how are you going to get out to them like nothing's going to happen unless you get out to them and so my answer is always like the tipping point the best answer I got but it sounds like with your research it came out saying that when the group has a perceived value it'll bring along those laggards it'll bring along all those kind of more recalcitrant people yeah I think maybe that might be a bit of a too strong formulation <laughs> So I think it's also important to note here, it's that those effects are, of course, not that if you move, if you ensure that people acknowledge that others care about these topics as well, maybe also in a group which is not prototypical pro environmental, that this still might be an important topic to those people, that that immediately causes all people within that group to take these actions. So it will have an impact, but it's not that from being completely non-environmental, you all of a sudden become completely environmental. It's just boosting people, their motivation. It gives a, a, just a slightly bit more motivation to take these actions, which might be might make people might be, might make people think or take a certain action which they, they previously wouldn't, but it's not that they all of a sudden are going completely pro environmental or something like that. So and I think that's also with, with a lot of psychological research or many things, there are so many things that influence your behaviors that many of these things can have an impact and can have also a big impact if you look at society. But it's not that if you're going to do something, you're all of a sudden going to make someone completely pro-environmental or completely supporting something or all people, let all people support something. It's just that within a population, you see an increase in these kind of things. Right. But I think I could probably... You could probably accurately say that better fying and reminding people of the pro-environmental group values helps to lift the laggards. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 Might, yeah. Mm. might be. It might also be the people who don't identify with the group and therefore are, are not influenced by that group because that group might not be that important to them. Mm -hmm. Or they might right. start disidentifying. But I think in this case, it's also... You can try to convince everybody to do something, but maybe first make sure that you have a large enough group to make sure that, that, that many people see this as, as something which needs to be done. And then in the end, those others will also well, take these actions. Or, well, there will always be a minority which probably won't take these actions. But I think if you want a large group to do... To, to, I think the important thing is that it's not necessarily... How do you say it? I think it's important to... Many people are already motivated to take certain actions. And I think it's really important to make sure that those people also take these actions so that you take away these barriers. And there's, of course, also a group which is really not caring about these topics at all. And it's, of course, also important to make sure these people, if you want to, to make environmental behavior more widespread across society, that those people might start doing things as well. But it might also be really difficult to reach them. So it might not be the first group you, you may want to target then. It might be the most difficult group to... And I think maybe also a lot of attention and energy is spent on those people, whereas those might be the people who are most difficult to achieve something with, at least within this topic. Right. You mean that we, sh we should not start with the most difficult people, or we should start with them? I think it's important to make sure that the many people that are motivated, that you enable them to also act right, on right. these motivations. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like that, yeah, the tipping point, which is let's just, like there's, there's such big low-hanging fruit with getting the people that are already motivated to do stuff that it will kind of, at least if we get them involved, it will should spill out over to the more recalcitrant people. And then maybe even if we ever achieve that, we can get to them. 
<laughs> get to them yes. later. So in practice, what would your advice be of how this can be better implemented, say, by sustainability managers at cities, a climate program manager at a utility, the EPA, the federal government? How can they, they get to work every day, they have a meeting, how can they how can they practically kind of like draw on these insights and put them into practice more? I think that, well, the important things are one is make sure people can do it. So help people in acting on these kind of values. So you can support them. It can be education, just showing people what they can do, how they could achieve this. It can also be shown to people that many people within, for instance, a city care about these topics and thereby create this social values, norms that might also stimulate people. So you can make things really visible, for instance, through campaigns. Many people are doing these kind of actions. And I think what's really important is that you focus on what could be done and what many people care about instead of, so, so many people care about these things and then also make sure that you really address these values and enable people to do these things they care about, the environmental things they care about. And I think that's often, I, I'm not sure whether many, mm, yeah, now I'm thinking a bit, <laughs> you probably have to cut this out then okay. <laughs> because now I'm, I'm but so to come back to the answer, so maybe I, I just start over with the answer then. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So what can yeah. practical people, it's their job, they're sitting at a meeting, they're trying to design a campaign, like what can they, what can what was practical things that they can do in their job? Yeah, I think so. Related to my research, I think the most important thing is make these things visible. So make environmental that people care about these environmental topics, that they are willing to take certain actions, but also that they are already taking actions, make that visible. So thereby you get this social group, which does these actions, which might motivate people to do the same thing, also show it to others, because many people may, might be privately motivated, but if they believe that others don't care about these topics, they might not be willing to show this because they think others may think bad of them when they engage in these kind of behaviors. So make really sure that there's a supportive social context and try to create that for, for instance, through, for instance, campaigns, advertisements, making those people visible, making those actions really visible. And I think another thing is taking away many of the other barriers. So make sure that's not too costly for people. So maybe it can be subsidies, can be other things make it easier for people to do these kind of things and educate them how they could do this. So if they care about these things, how could you translate these values to practice and then make sure that, that people are able to act on it? And I think a big advantage of that is also that people act on their values, the things they care about, which also make them happy typically. So yeah. if it's important to you and you are enabled to act on these kind of things, then it's also a boost for how you feel about yourself. And so then it also has other positive consequences, even for the individuals who are performing it. So not only environmental. Oh yeah, this this relationship between acting on your values and your, what do they call it? The green glow effect. I've got to find, I've got to do another yes, indeed, that's funny. With, you, with whoever did that research, the green, the green glow. But it, yeah, it sounds like the way to do it is to say, like, this is who we are. These, This is, as a community, this is who we are. This is the types of people we are. And like what you mentioned before, that reminding people of environmental things they've done before helps cement the environmental identity to help them do more. These are the types of, this is what people in our community are doing. This is our new norm. This is that we are normally these environmentally conscious citizens. This is our city's value system, our town's value system. And trying to weave that into the whole campaign, that's like a totally different approach to basically saying, here's a burning earth. If we don't stop climate change, we're all going to die, <laughs> which is a lot yes, of like environmental difference. messaging that, that goes on. Or like the ocean is full of plastic and we all have to stop now is quite different to being like, we are people who protect the ocean. This is our value system. We care. We choose to take, take action both politically and individually. It's quite a different tone and a, to a, a style of communication to kind yeah, of... It's like often that the indeed way. people communicate what's going bad and how many things people do wrong. And that might give the exact wrong... Or, or it might actually demotivate people because they think, well, nobody cares about this topic. It's apparently it's completely unimportant. So why should I? And I think it's indeed really important to communicate that these things are important to people. And maybe not even that it's a new norm, I think also for many people, it's already a norm which, or, or, or values which exist for a really long time. So that it's something which is really part of that identity. It can be part of the city identity. It can be part of an organizational identity and does not necessarily have to be new. It's also something where 
maybe in, in history, many people within that city already cared a lot about. So it's just part of the identity, but highlighted. Mm -hmm. When it's really focusing on solutions and, and examples of, yeah. what, of what people are doing. Okay, we better get to the end. I always go half an hour longer than I plan on doing it because I always <laughs> love to talk about all the things. So anyway, we have to wrap up also because I have a, another call at, at 10.30 I need to go to. So yeah. two more questions. Second last question is, what are you most excited about researching in the future? I think the topic you, you just discussed about value change and how values develop, I think that's something super interesting and where you can have a big impact with. So I think those things, I, I would really like to, to research those in more detail and, and focus on this more. How, how does this all, how do people form their values? Where, where, where are they based on and how can you influence that? I think that's, that's very interesting. And stuff. how we turn so, someone from an, an ego value system to a transcendent value system in midlife. Yeah, that's that, maybe that someone in practice can <laughs> translate it to, I, I, I prefer to stay on the, the neutral side in this. Okay, okay. And if you could look 100 years into the future, where a lot of our big problems in the world, climate change, plastic pollution, deforestation, all these things were solved and the world was a lot better, what would be the one thing that you would like to see happen? If there was one like key in a lock that you think would be critical to making that chain of events happen, what would you think that was? I think better acknowledging where we care about and also from each other. So not only knowing where you yourself care about, but also knowing better where other people care about. And I think that can, well, that, that might be also a social tipping point in which people start to re realize that it's something you do together and you care about together and also therefore are willing to take these kind of actions. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful way to end our fascinating conversation today. Thanks so much for joining me, Thais. And thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. 